Geiger. Welcome to No Movies in Hell. I'm Klaus Scott. And I'm Adam Stovall. And Adam is our special guest today as we recap 2021, our favorite movies. Welcome, Adam. Thanks for having Adam, me. Adam, do you want to tell our viewers a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm, I'm here because I'm a friend of Chris and I made a movie called A Ghost Waits. Um, we, Chris and I met back in Cincinnati, which is actually, which is also where we shot The Ghost Waits. It was really exciting to, because it was really exciting to like make, make something in Cincinnati and kind of wear the Cincinnati-ness proudly. You know, the t-shirts are all Cincinnati. The, the book that the guy, uh, that the lady is reading at the end is a Cincinnati author. Like the art is Cincinnati artists. You know, that was, that was really exciting and also just exciting to make a movie because I'd wanted to do that my entire life and we didn't have a whole lot of money. So I wrote, directed, produced, edited, shot part of it, was in it, did catering, like, you know, all, all the stuff, (laughs) but, and then we got into some festivals and we got, we won some awards, which were those, and then uh, got distributed by Arrow and yeah, now I just have a movie out in the world and it's really weird. (laughs) (laughs) Congratulations. Well, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Tell uh, but, uh, us about the distribution. Where can people see A Ghost Wait? Uh, so Arrow Video is uh, distributing it. They're a really great UK-based distributor. Basically, I love, like, as you can see, I love physical media. I, and so the, the opportunity that, to make a Blu-ray that I would want to buy, to, like, pack it with special features. So you can buy that anywhere you buy Blu-rays online. And there's some stores that have them. I bought one. I bought a copy of Forbidden Planet here in New York. And then, if you are not into the whole physical media thing, you can rent it or buy it online at Amazon, iTunes, Google, all those places. Nice. Is it Arrow A R R O W or Arrow A E R? Okay. A R R O W. I will put oh. that link in the description um, on YouTube oh, you. when we post this, so that'll be up for everyone's easy access. Very cool. Yeah, and you can also just go to aghostweights.com uh, and it has all the links and we have a merch shop and stuff now. So yeah. Awesome. Everything's there. So 2021, big year for movies. Obviously COVID was a big factor. Theaters were reopening cautiously. People were coming back slowly. At first the theaters were holding space. So if you bought a seat, the seat next to you is blocked out or in the beginning, even two seats next to you were blocked out. It was great. Now it's a free for all. <laughs> People are sitting right next to you. They're great. packed yep. in the theater, uh, which you might think is awesome, and you or you might wish for the old days when you had a little bit more. It definitely took time. some like getting used to again. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I went to see In the Mood for Love at IFC Center, and that was the first time they had not blocked out seats. And so it was, and it was a packed house. Yep. So it was, I was just like, oh, not comfortable at all. <laughs> <laughs> now, Please don't cough. Please yeah. don't sneeze. <laughs> yeah. Now it's like it was before. I was like, all right, <laughs> you, know, you know, keep your mask on or on the street and popcorn drinking. I don't know if you remember, but before the pandemic, when you went in to buy your tickets online, at least for AMC, they wouldn't let you leave an empty seat in between. They mm-hmm. like you yep. had to buy the seat next to someone. Yeah. So it's shocking now when someone sits right next to you. Like, did you did you know that you were sitting right next to someone when you bought? <laughs> did this you ticket? choose this? What's wrong right. with you? Who you hurt you? Intentionally picked that seat, and you knew this one was full. Yep. Yep. It's okay though. I'm getting. I'm. I'm I'm going to get over that soon, <laughs> any minute now. <laughs> I mean, because I, I, I just went and saw two movies at Kips Bay and like, it, they're just such small theaters. Like you don't have an option if you want to see Nightmare in Alley. It's like two or three rows. No, Red Rocket was two rows. Nightmare Alley was like four, but yeah, <laughs> it's, so, it's so small. I know. Well, when we saw Dune, it was in a giant theater, but it was so packed that we were sitting super close to the screen and there are people on both sides of us yep yeah dune was the first film i've seen no that's not true it was shang chi it was the first one that i seen that it was a packed theater and it was supposed to be 
um, you know, the seat next to you or the pairs of seats next to you were supposed to be empty. And it, what, that was the first time where I was like, oh, you guys are actually trying to like sell out this theater. And it was at Alamo Draft House too. Oh, wow. <laughs> what was everybody's first movie back? Uh, I, yeah. I think it would have to be Cruella. When okay. we saw Cruella, that was the first one I've seen in the movie theater since uh, yeah. March yeah, of 2022, 20, 2020. Yes. Yeah. How about you? Tenet was mine because I, oh. <clears throat> I wanted to see something that I didn't care that much about, you know? So <laughs> like if I got there and I didn't feel safe, I would leave because I'm dumb. Like my brain is broken. If I go to see Mission Impossible and I don't feel safe, I will just stay and watch Mission Impossible. But Tenet, I was like, eh, you know, I'm not... I appreciate Nolan and I think he's made some really incredible stuff, but I, my mileage varies with him much more than a lot of people I know. Mm -hmm. And especially with Tenet, like the movie spends the entire time explaining itself to you. You know, that's why I didn't understand people saying like, oh, you got to watch it more, more, multiple times to get it. Like, no, it's all there. You might have to watch it. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's constantly telling you what's happening. <laughs> Like, it was really weird. <laughs> I've never had a movie just say, you get it at the end of every scene. Uh, all right. Well, glad I saw it. <laughs> yeah, I saw Tenant. Uh, it was my first movie back. It was literally the only movie showing in a multiplex in a mall in San Diego. So we happened to be there visiting um, family and we saw that the theater was open there when the theaters were closed in New York still. So we were like, let's go see a movie. And yeah. it had to be Tenant because, you know, it's like the Ford thing. You can have any car as long as it's black. You can watch any <laughs> movie as long as it's Tenant. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. um, but I just liked being back in the theater. I, I do like Christopher yep. Nolan and I thought that the movie was going to be good from a production standpoint, exceptional, right? Like, hot, like he does things that are so high end in terms of just special effects and the cinematography. And so I thought it was great from that perspective. I don't know that it was my favorite one, certainly, but I will always remember it as the first one back. Yeah. Um, it didn't make my top five though. Mm. <laughs> nope. So let's start from the bottom. Um, Adam, as our special guest, what was your number five? Yeah, so it was really hard to get it down to five. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to start with Pig. Nice. I knew nothing going in. I, I, a buddy and I do a little, little like movie and writing days um, or we'll see something and he was just like, you want to see the new Nicolas Cage movie? I'm like, oh, I'm always down to watch a Nicolas Cage movie. Like, sure. What's the worst that could happen? Um, and was not prepared for like a meditation on grief and loss. Uh, also, I love Nicolas Cage saying, I don't fuck my pig. I want that like as my ringtone. It made me so happy. Uh, but no, the movie was amazing. Did you guys see Pig? I did not. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it's on Hulu now. You can stream it. It's, it's really worth your time. And it's not a long movie. I want to say it's like 90 minutes, um, which I know we all care about run times here. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, <laughs> I know. The 90 minute. It's, it's yeah. a dying art. Tight 90, as we say in our household. Yes. Um, I, it's funny, a ghost waits is 79 minutes and I do have it in the back of my head. I'm like, I do want to make a three hour movie at some point, but like at the same time, like <laughs> who has time? <laughs> Could you just give us yes. an intermission? I'm down for a three hour movie, yes. but please let me pee in the middle. Ex exactly. We like, why have we not brought back the intermission now that every movie is at least two and a half hours long? Yeah. Ugh. Plus trailers, and I want to see the trailers so more I like, get there on time. So now we're like looking a, at a three-hour adventure. It's like yeah. Gilligan's Island. <laughs> more like no time to pee, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> so, Laquan, what was your number five? Oh, this was so hard. Um, so my number five was something actually we did not review. But my number five was West Side Story. It was like cinematically beautiful. Obviously, we're related, to, you know, we're, uh, for me, it was kind of that relation of like the Lincoln Center and pre-Lincoln Center and the story leading up. And I loved all of the images, the cinematography, 
the the visuals were just so beautiful and i just for me i was trying to think of the top five films that stuck out to me and this was number five and what really stuck out like what what really put it over the top for me was all the peripheral characters if that makes sense so not necessarily the leads but like the supporting actors the the colors the the situational there's some new added elements I thought like literally if you could take the two main characters out <laughs> it, it would be a really interesting film just to see the environment and mm-hmm. and, and and everyone and uh, interact with each other but overall I thought it was a great film it's honestly the first time I've seen West Side Story I have not seen the original I have not read the book either it was a book <laughs> no Broadway even no Broadway have not seen it on Broadway wow um and I really liked it cool all that right my number five what about you Chris your number five um just before we talk about that we probably should have said how we went about picking our yeah. top five for no movies in hell we have a ranking system um and it's based it's a, a 30 scale and so we have 10 different categories and each category can get a one, two or three rating. Uh, one being below average, two being average, three being better than average for that category. Uh, we did not employ that process though for our top five. It was just, what do we like this year um, in picking our top five? And Adam mentioned before we started recording that he didn't even limit it to movies produced this year. He um, limited it to movies that he saw this year, which. I know many of us have seen movies from prior to this year, just because of COVID, we're doing a lot of streaming these days. Yes. I normally so. would not have done that, but the my number one is so far and away my favorite thing I saw this year that, and which is because I'm like completely obsessed with a lot of the movies on this list, but yeah, the, I would not normally, I would normally keep it to the current year, but <laughs> I just love it so much. Uh. So that being said, my five, my number five is at Zola. Oh, nice. So at Zola to me was different and it was fun. And it was, you know, as fun as attempted murder can be, or I don't, did that, I guess maybe that guy actually passed. So he would, anyway, um, I didn't actually look up the real story about it, but at Zola was very fun to watch. Uh, I wasn't expecting it. I didn't know going in what it was going to be, but I knew it was an A24. So I figured it was worth the chance and Mm -hmm. um, it just turned out to be great. And I recommended it to a ton of people. It was in and out of theaters super fast. So a lot of people I recommended it to didn't get a chance to see it. I think it's actually hard to find streaming. Yeah, I think it is on the streaming service now. Is it? Yeah. So at Zola. Yeah, so Janice Bravo is a fascinating filmmaker. I don't know if you've seen her other stuff. She directed, there was a limited series on FX, Miss America, Miss America, Mrs. Mrs. America. Uh, And she directed the episode where Sarah Paulson goes through a journey at a convention. And it's, that episode is one of my favorite things I saw this year. Like, I think Janice Bravo has like a real masterpiece in her. Like, I liked Zola. It it didn't, it's not on the list, but I, I liked it a lot. I think she is genuinely like, she approaches all of the stuff, every scene, everything in a really interesting way. She's a, she's a real director. And Riley Keough, I think. I love it. It was so stylish. Yeah. Riley's it definitely amazing. had a very distinct, like, aesthetic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Have, did you ever see Riley, uh, the first season of The Girlfriend Experience? No. No. It's a great performance. It's so interior. <laughs> and just like oh man yeah if you ever get a chance it's really it's really worth your time I will look that up um she's somebody who when I see her in movies I don't recognize her immediately yeah she's very pretty but she's not I don't she, to me she doesn't have a distinctive look or I at least haven't latched on to what that is yet and so she does melt very well into the character that she's playing mm-hmm. she was just in something else that I saw and I didn't know who she was. And I looked her up later. And I was, oh, oh. <laughs> what was it? What else? Uh, what was the other thing? You know what? Lisa? I can't even think. I can't even remember now. But it wasn't. She wasn't the primary. Oh, it was House That Jack Built. 
Oh, yes. He plays one of the yeah. one of the people uh, that he encounters along the way, uh, yes. which is not a current movie, but I somehow missed it in 2018 when it came out. So I just streamed it the other day. Yeah, I actually saw the director's cut of that at the Esquire in Cincinnati. It was nice. it was kind of a one night event at like a few theaters around the country. They were showing the director's cut, and it was uh, I love. I, love, I really love Lars von Trier. Yeah. <laughs> I love his movies. Maybe not him as a person, <laughs> but hit movies. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, we had this conversation yesterday. <laughs> 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 well, he's so great, right? His movie, his work comes up a lot. So yeah. I feel like every time you say, I really like Lars von Trier, you have to qualify it by saying not the person. <laughs> I interviewed him some years back uh, for Antichrist. And he was a really lovely person to talk to, mm. you know, I mean, he's a provocateur and he's going to go out there and say edgy stuff because he wants to get a reaction out of people, but he's also just a really nice person. I, you know, I, I have not yet gotten over to Denmark, I think is where he lives, but I'm like, when I do like, let's, <laughs> let's, let's hang out. You know, <laughs> if you're drinking at the time, we'll grab a drink, but um, no, it was, he was very sweet, but yeah, he is very, provocative you yes. know the nazi yes. comments you don't really walk back from those it's a tough it's <laughs> yeah. a tough road so, back you know we can make jokes about anything but like the joke has to be really good and so if you're going to touch on certain things yeah you know. that's fair anyway all right number four adam number four is the green knight Ooh. um yeah i i had seen you know online like people were talking about it and went and saw it at, I don't remember where I saw it now, probably in AMC, uh, Lincoln Square, and just immediately became obsessed with the filmmaking. I, I went and listened to, went and uh, checked out a lot of the interviews with David Lowry, who's just a fantastic filmmaker. But he, A24 was going to put it out last year. And then they said, well, we, this really needs to be seen on a big screen. We'll hold it until people are back in theaters. And he said, oh, well, if we have more time, can I please take another crack at the editing? The editing of the film, it is the best edited film of the year to me. I, like, yeah. it's very elliptical and it, while it never like strays from story, I think it prioritizes emotion and character over story, which you don't often see mm -hmm. editing do this well. I remember one filmmaker, like, he was like, oh, I'm going to edit based on theme and the editing of his movie is awful. But no, this, The Green Knight, I mean, what it's saying about how like what we imagine our lives to be and then what they end up being and just how time I get like I've always been kind of obsessed with time but over the last two years I've become very obsessed with time and how we experience it and how we experience it differently from each other um, it's why Mad Men's my favorite show is because I think it captures the way we move through the world and move through time in a way that nothing else ever has so the Green Knight um, so my number four is licorice pizza. Um, I've been, oh, this is tough because I, I've gotten into PTA in the last 10 years. I would not say like my all time favorite is there will be blood. So interesting to see how this film went back to San Fernando Valley, went to kind of the course of dealing with, you know, a child star, his for the lack of better term, like babysitter, but how like this kind of maturity and just the things that happen, you know, kind of in this town and with these people and going back to the seventies and kind of how laissez-faire things were, but also the story between like this friendship and, you know, other things that, that happened between these kind of like Hollywoodish type people. And I found it fascinating. I really liked it. It was definitely a vibe, I guess. And <laughs> I was totally waiting for something like that just to be like, oh, this is good. And, and, and this is, this is great. And, and so I, I really, I really enjoyed it. And so it was my number four. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I really loved that movie. I, I had also been waiting for a long time for it. Uh, he's he's the one that you I show up for. I actually that was it was on my birthday. It was released oh. on my birthday this year. So I got to like, spend my birthday with it, uh, oh, nice. which was really lovely. Yeah, he's, 
and to, to have watched him evolve over his career and you know they look like uh, they look, uh there, there will be blood but even before that you know because you had boogie nights and magnolia which definitely feel of a piece together yes and then punch drunk love kind of comes out of nowhere and it feels like ever since then he's just been zigging and zagging you yes. know like he never wants to recover any ground I, the master is probably my favorite of his movies at this point. Oh, wow. Um, okay. I, cause I, that was one where I, ge- I genuinely was like, I don't know that I've ever seen anything like this, mm-hmm. you know, like the, there will be blood still feels very in conversation with Westerns and uh, you know, these, these character epics that we got back in the fifties and sixties, especially, but just applied to a very different kind of character. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like since then, I mean, he really seems to understand that he gets to he gets to make movies that nobody else can. You know, nobody else is going to have the latitude to make Phantom Thread at the budget that he gets. Yes. So <laughs> he seems to really take that seriously. And I, I, I love it. Awesome. Yay. Definitely awesome. Oh, what is this? Oh, my number four yes, is Hey. <laughs> so Adam, good taste. Uh, I ranked it number four. I really like, I, I didn't really know what to expect. My I husband, missed the title. What's your number four? It's Pig. Oh, okay. Awesome. Um, <laughs> so I had just watched The Truffle Hunters. And mm. so I was kind of on a mushrooming theme. And this came out like Nicolas Cage, Le- Raising Arizona, by far my all-time favorite movie. Nicolas Cage, Moonstruck, also in like my top all-time favorite movie list. Um, so Nicolas Cage, big fan. So when this came out, I was like, oh, okay, let, let's let's see what happens. Yeah. And it was great. And I thought it was really almost mythical, the character that he plays and the interaction that he has with the father and son. You know, the father and son are very much like the king and the prince and the king, you know, is this kind of grizzled, jaded, you know, the 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 queen is in distress but the the king can't help her and the prince get feels you know helpless and abandoned and so nicholas cage comes in as this sort of outsider almost. like the knight that left the court almost right or like <laughs> yeah. you know, back in the day they would have like the not the jesters but like these kind of crazy seers mm-hmm. who would come in and like give advice right that's the whole thing uh that you hear about with um, like in Russia, like, right. Like rescue. And like, there's just this crazy guy who comes in and like gives advice. Um, and so his interaction with the, the family dynamic, I thought was interesting all the while, you know, you're seeing his story too and the loss of his uh, wife and like how he sort of went off grid. Uh, it seems like because of that, um, although maybe there were other things that played into it too. But, uh, you know, I thought the story was amazing. I thought it was well told. He did a great job and everyone did a great job yeah. in their roles. And uh, yeah, highly recommend. I will definitely need to watch that because both of you guys, four and five. Yep. <laughs> and Which I mean, made it's... me, this made me mad. Um, there was another Nicolas Cage movie that came out right after this and I wasn't able to catch it in theater because it was only out for like a week. Yeah. Um, Will- Willie's Wonderland. Prisoners of Ghostland. Oh, Prisoners of- man, he, he puts out so many movies. Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was very upset. Like I was so excited about Pig. I thought it was great. And then all of a sudden I realized I just missed like another one. Yeah. And then he has another one coming out next year. Mm-hmm. I think it's an A24, the unbearable weight of massive talent. And that looks oh, really yeah. good. He's like playing Nick Cage. Like, yes. Yeah. I have I have not watched the trailer yet. I've been, tra- it sounds interesting. So like, all right, I'm going to try to not know anything. Cause oh. I think that was part of what I loved about Pig <laughs> so much was it's been so long since I saw something that I knew nothing about going in. Yeah. So Adam, number three. Number three. Uh, Summer of Soul, the documentary that Questlove made about the Soul Festival of 1969, I believe. It, did, did you guys see that? I have not. I know it's on Hulu, yes. but it was also if for a quick minute was at the Nighthawk near me. So, yeah. It's just gorgeous. It is such a life affirming, you know, it, it, 
I, I feel like this year we really, you know, it's kind of like how Shit's Creek was the most streamed thing early in the early in quarantine. Like we we really need kindness and we need things that, you know, we want to reflect the times that we're in, but we're, it's also just like, oh my God, like, can you just give me a hug? And I think Summer of Soul is a hug of a movie. Ooh, I like that. Now I'm going to need, I, I'm going to watch that today. <laughs> You're going to have a good day. <laughs> I, I, I really hope so. I really, I really need it. Like, yeah, yeah, we need a hug. I like that. <laughs> All right, Laquan, number three. My number three uh, was Adam's number four, The Green Knight. I absolutely loved it. It was beautiful film. I love Dev Patel. I love, I think there's a Joel Egerton in there. Yeah, Joe Edgerton. Mm-hmm. Of course, there's Alicia Viscender playing two different characters. I really love the development of it in the new retelling of, you know, King Arthur. And yeah, this journey, you know, and what you expect and what you don't expect. And, and it kind of mirrors like a New York experience too. It's like you leave your home and you're like, hey, so <laughs> can someone help me? And it's like, well, how much are you going to pay me? <laughs> <You know? laughs> And you run into these obstacles and you just get stronger and the visual, you know, of course, for me, visuals, the colors, I love like that emerald green and the mustard and, you know, the things that he has to hold on to and kind of these knowing what his fate is. But then, of course, it's, you know, it, it changes on you. And I, I just, I really like this film. I wish it were out in theaters a little longer. I know it's on streaming, but the effect I saw it like a Sunday afternoon at Nighthawk there weren't too many people in the theater it was it was really really great experience yeah it, you're you touched on it and I, I kind of forgot to mention but like it's about consequences in a way that we really never see anymore mm-hmm. you know and th- that idea of like you know your fate but you're, you just live in hope that you don't know your fate. <laughs> yes, exactly. You put yeah. it off to the side of like, okay, I can't think about this right now because I just need to do what I need to do. Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> I, I cackled in the theater at that moment when he, when, when Dev Patel does a thing and then is given some crucial information. He's just like, <laughs> oh, shh. <laughs> like <laughs> cackled <laughs> and we don't mind spoilers like we yeah well okay we'll just claim them and we'll say like spoiler <laughs> coming up so feel free to talk about it. we've already actually done an episode on the yes, green night of the green night. Oh, okay uh, where we talked about everything that happened so yeah when he lops his head off and the guy's like what you do to me i will do to you and she's like oh no <laughs> like why why couldn't you have told me that five minutes ago <laughs> i would have given you a brownie <laughs> right yeah <laughs> oh i love yeah. that movie and chris you're number three so my number three was escape from mogadishu oh i didn't which, even hear about this so it's a korean movie i run a meetup called I Heart Korean Movies because AMC Empire 25 will show foreign language films in their smaller theaters one for one week. So I get to see Raging Fire and I got to see, you know, like a lot of the more popular Asian language films and I Heart Korean Movies made Escape from Mogadishu one of their movies. It was also the opening night pick for the New York Asian Film Festival this year. Um, So I figured it had to be pretty good if it was their opening night pick and AMC was going to show it. And it was great. It was a story that I hadn't heard before, but basically um, while they were evacuating the city um, because it's being taken over by rebels, while they're evacuating the city, the North Korean embassy and the South Korean embassy were in trouble. They couldn't get out safely. And so they had to come together and they were the, the dynamic between the two groups, they were suspicious of each other. They were both plotting how do we get the other people to defect to our side as we're trying to help each other escape this very dangerous situation. There were funny parts. There were, uh, it, was, it was just great. Is this a documentary? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's entirely fiction, I'm pretty sure. I mean, you know, obviously there was an evacuation of the city, but uh, I think. 
And maybe the North Koreans and South Koreans ended up on the same plane out. But I think most everything else was maybe not true. But uh, still a great movie. <laughs> I, need to, I need to see that. And I think I need to attend some of these I Heart Korean movie meet meetups. Same. Uh, unfortunately, we're not like AMC is busy right now. So they're not showing a lot of foreign language films these okay. days. And I Heart Korean Movies is going on hiatus for the next two months anyway. Okay. But plug for New York Asian Film Festival because they really bring some interesting things. And back when it was all in person, you get to see things I saw as, I don't even like zombie movies, but I saw a zombie comedy romance movie, which as a combination was just weird, but it was fun and it was so good. It's called, uh, I think it's called Zombie for Sale. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, that was, I've never seen a movie like that. It was great and That's I loved it. such a fun movie. Yes, yeah. I saw all that in uh, Glasgow last year at the festival before okay. it really shut down, yeah. Yeah, oh. so yeah, New York Asian Film Festival, props to them. They do a great job in bringing just that is also an arrow title, by the way. Oh, okay. Oh, nice. <laughs> Same distributor. Yep. Excellent. So Arrow clearly has very good taste. Uh, clearly. <laughs> so Escape from a Good Issue, that's my number three. Nice. What about you, number two, Adam? Number two, uh, number one movie of the year for me is in terms of movies made, you know, put out this year. How how awful would it be if I said a ghost waits? I'm not uh <laughs> It's a movie called Nine Days. Nine, Nine days. days. Nine Days is of, of movies that I saw this year that were put out this year. I knew nothing. I actually, I saw it because I just like, I, I want to see something I know nothing about. I'm fine with it being bad. I just want to see something and that's completely fresh. And I saw Nine Days and I was like, cool, I'll do that. I was weeping when it was over. It is the most beautiful movie about what it is to be a person, what it is to have a soul. It's, and that's kind of what it's about. I, I want people to see this movie, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's about, it's this kind of uh, secular, uh, not afterlife, it's pre-life really. It's just this space and Winston Duke is one of a few people or one of a few entities that uh when a baby is born they choose the soul that goes into the vessel mm -hmm. and bill skarsgård zazzy beats tony hale and a few other people are potential souls and they have nine days to see for him to observe what kind of person they would be and kind of decide what what the world needs what kind of people the world needs it's very small you know, it, I, I've, I've, because of, you know, making uh, my movie with, for a very low budget and having to maximize every resource, I've become very attuned to like, oh, you, you did not have a lot of money, but like it, it feels big. You know, they were able to, he, uh, Edison Koa, I think is the, the, the person's name who made it. It feels immense and it has a massive heart and, and, and but you you can also you it's very clear that they did not have a lot of money making it and it doesn't matter i i, I wish everyone would see nine days i think it's the best thing nice is it available on streaming uh i don't know let me see oh I'll, i don't think it is <laughs> Uh, here's a nice, I'll, I'll just do a plug for realgood.com or the real good app, R E E L G O O D all one word. Uh, they are great in terms of if you need to see if anything's streaming. Oh, nice. Okay. That's very, thank you for that resource because all right, yeah. I'm going to put that in the YouTube description too. R E E L G O O D. So nine app. days is not streaming anywhere. That's uh, surprising. It's you can rent it, you can buy it. Um, but it's not streaming anywhere. Oh. So. Well, hopefully it'll get a second life yeah. next year. <laughs> yeah, I, I, did I hope see, people find it. I did see Nine Days based on your recommendation. Uh, oh, fantastic. It was still out in theaters when you told me about it, so I found it. I thought it was great. So I, yeah. I appreciated that you recommended it back then. I'm so glad you saw it. Because yeah. I think you're the second person I know <laughs> that did. 
I have talked about this movie all year long, and like I find I got somebody, yay! <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I thought it was interesting that it does seem like it was entirely filmed on a soundstage, but you can't, you could suspend disbelief easily to make it seem expansive. And I will say that I think they used. I don't know, maybe they did or maybe they didn't. But the tragedy of Macbeth seems very mm. similar in terms of some of the shots. It seems like, is that a, just a sound stage where they've just like made this, it just seem endless, this infinite yeah. sky? I did. I just saw somebody on Twitter say, I love the thing that you love about tra- tragedy of Macbeth is that it, lo- it seems like they just went into a closet and made a movie for a few days. <laughs> and then, like, yeah, it, right. you definitely have the feeling that they might just be on a giant soundstage. But then you also know, this is Joel Cohen and Francis McDormand. They were well-funded. If they wanted to be, right. if they wanted to be out in a field and build this entire set from scratch, they could have. Um, I'm excited to see it. Thanks. It is good. Okay, LaCroix, what is your number, number two? My number two is 2021's Nightmare Alley. I really, I really enjoyed it. It's, it's not so much of a, of a slow burn, I guess for me, because I had seen the 1947 version uh, a couple days ago, prior to seeing Guillermo del Toro's uh, interpretation. Uh, I thought, I think Chris and I discussed this, but I am not a, a fan of Bradley Cooper, but I really enjoyed him in as uh this in this character as a character in this film um I hope he's nominated for an Oscar I mean that doesn't you know determine his worth uh whatsoever but he did I think he did a fantastic job I think uh Kate Blanchett obviously she did a fantastic job I love Guillermo del Toro's use of all these his his characters his circle of folks that he reuses in different films I liked his also, you know, also the Guillermo de Toro, Toro touch of a little bit of horror and a little bit of gore. I thought that it, this was a beautiful film from start to finish, and I I think I, I encourage people to watch it. I, I I really liked it. I did too. I just saw it yes uh, two days ago. So on Tuesday, and I loved it. Yeah, it's it never. We were talking afterwards. Like it's a long movie. It's you know it's not a two and a half hour movie, but it never felt long to me. Yeah, you know, like it it moves. Um, and yeah, I mean his Ron Perlman and you know the, the old standbys. I do like Bradley Cooper. I I um, a friend a, a friend when he got cast as uh, Rocket Raccoon in in Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm-hmm. A friend was just like, why would they cast him? Like, give it to a voice actor. Like, come on. I, I, I remember saying, I think this is going to work because he has a line delivery in The Hangover that I, I think about often when he says, I should have been a cop. Like, he, and, and it, for Nightmare Alley, like, he takes on these characters, like, the fact that he's a beautiful man is inarguable. But, like, in Nightmare Alley, like, is explicitly, like, you get to do all this because you're very pretty yes and like and you didn't have to like you're you're just broken inside but like yes. people are willing to it's why they always say it's a maybe it's like it's only a maybe because you want him to be a yes yep <laughs> like that's a no that's a no dude <laughs> <laughs> very very true <laughs> definitely i totally agree i think nightmare alley was amazing um and uh yeah no doubt Good did two and a half make, hours. Did it make your number two? Well, you know, the original was about the same. It was about two and a half hours. And as mentioned in the Nightmare Alley uh, episode, the Stan character did not have a backstory in the original. It was very much like he was a hustler. Like you knew what he was after and how, like how he was going to get it. Whereas this one, it was very more, it was a little subtle. He used his his looks to kind of, get by and then it started to become a little aggressive as the movie progressed i is it, it's also like his interpretation of it it was so cool because it does feel like a movie from the 40s mm-hmm. you know like the storytelling of it the characters but he has this thing and i i think uh he shares this with Lars von trier where he 
he he wants to look at the thing he wants to look at the thing that other people look away from so the way you know a face is mangled by a savage beating you know like the gore of it the violence of it it like watching it was like okay that's <laughs> like there's Guillermo yes. um he he does not look away from that stuff and yeah it, it felt it felt simultaneously classic and extremely modern yep yeah and Laquan and I were talking about this in our Nightmare Alley episode which I feel like goes along those same lines in terms of character development we don't have to like him he doesn't try to apologize for who that character is and he doesn't he doesn't try to redeem him at all where I feel like now the trend in movies has been like oh we have this villain but let's tell his backstory and he's not really a bad person it's just he's been through tough times or he's been mistreated or you know these things explain why the Cruella effect yes right, yeah right the Grinch. This, oh this, god yeah. right and <laughs> So this doesn't do that. And I like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so actually it didn't make my number two. Um, I picked Dune. Oh. Hey. Because <laughs> A, I had a very good movie watching experience with Dune. Um, but also I saw Dune, the David Lynch insanity version. <laughs> and I thought, oh, what? Well, ha- like how, why? <laughs> I don't really understand what's happening in this movie. And I don't, I, I never read the book. Um, I didn't see any of the other Dune iterations that have occurred, just the David Lynch one in preparation for watching this one, because this one I was set up to like, it's Denis Villeneuve, like he does a very good job, uh, like with visuals, especially with sand visuals, right? So we saw all of that happening in Blade Runner 2029. Yes. Um, so we know he does a good job with Sam. So <laughs> it's got a great cast, right? Like this one was set up to be the movie that it should have always been. And it made sense. Like it was told in a way where I was like, okay, I can follow this story. I understand what's happening. Um, the guy, Oscar. Uh, Isaac. The dad. Yeah. Yes. Oscar Isaac, I like him, saw him in Card Counter. Um, that was really great. So I think all the elements came together and June was just great on a ton of different, it checked off a ton of different boxes. Yeah, I feel like Dune is the most massive movie I've ever seen. Like it's <laughs> bananas to me that like a human being, that human hands made that movie. Um, and it, it gave me the closest feeling to uh, what it must have been like to watch Star Wars when it opened in 1977. Yeah. You know, where you're just like, holy crap, like the screen got bigger. Um, and yeah, Vill- Villeneuve, I really like, it, which is, it's odd because he's, he's kind of a humorless director. Like his movies are so serious and there's yeah. just, there's no real play uh there's no real fun but for whatever reason his brand of that really works for me you know i saw prisoners and really dug it on sundays is great arrival is one of my favorite movies of all time mm, that you know really good. yeah like he he's working on in, in why well, we say a sandbox which now feels like a pun um <laughs> that like nobody else really gets to work in you know he's because he t- takes these things very seriously. Blade Runner 2049, he takes on these kind of impossible tasks. They're, yeah. Cause you're not gonna please Blade Runner fans. Yeah. Like they can't even agree on which version of the same movie is the best one. <laughs> the director's <laughs> cut or the final cut or? <laughs> I mean, there's so, I, my buddy has like uh, the Blu-ray release that has like five different versions in one <laughs> thing. And like the people that made it can't even agree on what happens in it. Like Blade yeah. Runner's a bananas movie, but like you're gonna make the sequel to that, or and then Dune. Before we saw Dune, the only thing I had seen was Yodorowsky's Dune, a documentary about a version of it that doesn't exist. <laughs> like I had no idea what to expect, and yeah, was just was so impressed by just the sheer filmmaking of it, like. It is that, like, how do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. All right. Dun, dun, dun. 
Adam, number you're one. Number one. Um, the best thing I saw this year is this movie from 2008 called Lake Mungo. Have either of you seen Lake Mungo? No. No. Okay. It is <clears throat> not a documentary. <laughs> when you watch it, it is made as a documentary. It is a mockumentary, I, I guess. It is made in the style of a documentary, and it's about... It, this guy's only made one movie. Like, I don't know what, like, why they aren't bashing down his door to make more stuff. It's set in Australia. Uh, this girl goes missing, and... I'm of two minds, because I don't want to tell you what happens, but I also want to give you... An, like. It is an excellent ghost story and an excellent true crime story that's not true. And just, if you can't tell by now, I really like movies where like by the end, my heart is just like weeping. When it lands its final punch and like you think it's come and then it just keeps coming, um, I was devastated. I immediately went and ordered the second site release of the Blu-ray, which has a ton of features and, you know, it's region free, I think. So mm. you can watch it anywhere. Yeah. Like movies like this don't come along very often, you know, where it's just, it's such a singular vision executed perfectly. I'm sure he had to compromise. I'm sure there's things that don't land the way he wanted it to, but when you watch it, like it is just, it's, it's a beautiful story of oh, about a lot, but like kind of missed connection. Mm -hmm. um, how easy it is for time. The older I get, the more I think timing is the great villain of the universe. And it's about how easy it is for us to just miss ourselves or just miss each other. I cannot say enough good things about Lake Mungo. Go see it, go see it, go see it. I love this fucking movie with all of my heart. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, all I right down. um oh so for anyone who has not been taking notes i've been taking notes so i will also put in the description the actual write like write out the titles of each of our top five so if someone doesn't have a time have the time to watch our whole episode um, mm -hmm. i'll put it there and i'll also put it in an instagram post so people can get it that way maybe you should do like five like five to two <laughs> <laughs> to make them watch it yes yes that's, that's you smart. went the number that's a one good idea. you gotta sit through it that's smart <laughs> my number one we have just discussed it was dune i thought that it was a it was a mood and it was a whole it was a whole world building it was just like I'm going to show you that this is real or there's some type of like this exists out there in the universe and I'm going to tell this story and it's going to be very distinct and like I didn't mind it didn't feel like it was three hours either it was like I saw this in IMAX at Lincoln Center I sat down with a ton of people and it was just like you just melt into the narrative and it tells this really wonderful story and I love the costuming I loved everything about it the casting was great the the way that I have never read the book I had seen the uh David Lynch version earlier this year and it was it was just such a great film to watch and it was just like I want more and it's like so happy that there's going to be you know part two I feel like they did such, it, it was, it's so great. And I really love all of uh, Villeneuve. I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, but- Denis you know, Villeneuve. Villeneuve, okay. Villeneuve. Villeneuve. I love his films. I love The Rival. I loved Blade Runner 2049. I feel like is, I mean, I'm probably going to get canceled for this or whatever, but I feel like it's way better than- actual Blade Runner. <laughs> if he could go back and do Blade Runner <laughs> in 2049. I'm really happy with what they did for this film. They waited. Um, they pushed it back. They made it available on streaming and in the movie theaters and didn't compromise either. It, it still made a ton of money in the movie mm -hmm. theaters and it was available on HBO Max. 
So it was reaching both audiences, you know, folks who didn't feel comfortable going to theater. I think it's available on streaming until like tomorrow though, but, <laughs> but I wouldn't mind watching this again and again in, in the theater, just to see what the experience would be like on a, you know, maybe, you know, regular theater as opposed to IMAX, but yeah. I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed it. I do regret that I didn't see it again in the theater only because when we bought our tickets, they were so close to the screen that yes. I felt like there were certain things happening kind of up here and over there where I was like, what's happening over there? <laughs> yeah. and, and so, it was literally overwhelming. Yes. Yeah. Um, because it was IMAX too. Like we, yeah. the screen itself was so huge. And so I thought, I do want to go back and see it in the theater, but sit back a little bit so I can take in the whole visual at once. Um, but yeah, I agree. It was, I mean, it was my number two. So I thought it was great. Um, my number, one, number one is one. Nightmare Alley. Oh, Ooh. nice. So yeah. And I, it checks a lot of my personal boxes. Like, I don't know if you guys remember Carnival when it was on HBO, mm -hmm. but such a great show. I loved it. The aesthetic of that old sort of dust bowl kind of traveling circus thing that it, I don't know there's something tragic and romantic and you know this was definitely different than that because in that I think they tried to make it much more or much I guess it was still very stylized but in a in a grungier way where you know del Toro everyone's very pretty and clean and you know in carnival everyone's very dirty and like uh but you know it it was beautiful i thought he you could see elements of other movies mm -hmm. in nightmare alley you could see if you saw crimson peak mm -hmm. some of the visuals where she's in the dress as the apparition came directly from there some of the visuals from shape of water where they're in the institutional building where he's being kept and the pool like some of those visuals you could see translated directly into the uh sort of castle like building that the rich guy lives in so it like those institutional walls translated in those so it was almost like those were workshops for this um and i just thought it was amazing he's he is one of those filmmakers i i have a rule for in in my own work you should never remind the audience they could be watching a better movie <laughs> and because I most in most films, I don't really like pastiche. I don't like references to other movies. Like I didn't come to your movie to talk about Star Wars, um, you know. And but he is one of those filmmakers that's so good at taking from other films. The Crush Pizza, like, takes from so many different movies of of that era, but it never feels you know like it's always in service of something new. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just, hey, remember that movie, you know, <laughs> and yeah, Nightmare Alley, like it is, it's in conversation with his other films, films of that era, of this era, like of, of, with genres. I mean, yeah, he, he really is one of those like, uh, he conducts the symphony kind of filmmakers, yeah. you know, it just makes it all work together. Yeah, yeah. I, the end product is definitely, the payoff is there. All right, so yes. that was our 2021. Um, Are we guys, doing honorable mentions? Yeah, yeah. Ooh, honorable mentions. Okay, go for we'll it. Keep it, keep it brief. Um, <laughs> okay, the movie that like would be on the list if I hadn't had to kick, uh, if 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 it weren't for like Mungo, if I continue just this year is Titan. I walked mm. out of that theater a different person. <laughs> no, Titan is amazing filmmaking. Uh, I don't know if you if either of you saw it or saw, saw it. raw you did mm -hmm. like julia ducranau is just that that like that's the future of filmmaking um that yeah she's she's got it that um barb and star go to vista del mar was hilarious and i will brook no <laughs> dissent uh jamie dornan singing to to seagulls is maybe my favorite thing i saw all year um <laughs> Uh, in the Earth is a movie by Ben Wheatley, who is this British filmmaker that I just adore, and he makes things that nobody else is doing. 
um, in and of itself is this thing on Hulu. Uh, Derek Del Gaudio is a magician, raconteur, and I it was I don't know if it ever actually showed in a theater because it was actually a brought it was a a live theater thing here in the city. Um, but that was also one of my favorite things. I do just have like a whole list. Come on, come on was great. Power <laughs> of the Dog was great. Get back. Uh, the Beatles get back was fantastic. <laughs> it's eight hours long and it flew I by. Never want to hear that song again. <laughs> I'm so done. I get it. I get it. I get it. No. Yeah. Um, Look, yeah. do you have any honorable mentions? I do. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, Barb and Star Go to Vista Del Mar is actually really great. It is. I feel like it's going to be one of those like classics. I really wish that I would have seen it in the movie theater, but streaming. Yeah. Um, Long live Trish. Yeah, it, it was great. <laughs> Um, the Sparks Brothers documentary by Edgar Wright was really, really great. I had yeah. um, seen them at the Poisson Rouge in New York in 2018. Uh, we have their albums in the house. My husband is a huge fan. And then just seeing the documentary was really great. It just like the icing on the cake. And then also it's kind of like, I want to see you guys in, in, in like tour again. When is that going to happen? Question mark. <laughs> Right. They're going to need a bigger room this next tour, I think. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> Webster Hall. Who knows? <laughs> um, at Zola um, was honorable mentioned. Beautiful film. Um, uh, very, very funny. Surprisingly very funny. And just to think that all of this was just a story on Twitter. <laughs> oh, gosh. There's, there's a lot. There's a lot. Um, <laughs> I had one more. Um, the Suicide Squad. I do think that, you know, Marvel films are better, but like for DC, I really like this one, the the Suicide Squad, uh, James Gunn. I think he's great. I, I like what they did with this interpretation. I guess it's a sequel to the original. I love Margot Robbie as as Harley Quinn. Um, I don't see anybody else as Harley Quinn. And I really enjoyed uh, her film in 2019. Um, so this was, for me, I can watch this over and over again. I really liked it. And it was, it made honorable mention, unfortunately, not even the top 10. <laughs> um, it was, it was cool to see it. Like it had such an energy, like all its own, Yes. you know, like you're just like, nobody else makes this movie. Like, I can't believe they made a $200 million trauma film. <laughs> you know, just like, this is insane. And you're pretty about Margot Robbie. You're right. I can't like, I mean, I'm sure, you know, somebody else will eventually play that character, yeah. but it's almost like, you know, if Heath Ledger hadn't died, he would probably still be playing the Joker. Yes. Yeah. You know, Cause it was just like, who's going to, who is going to follow that? Like, right. no. Um, and it makes me wonder then like, are we, are we discounting her performances as, as Harley Quinn, you know, like, cause it's not up for Oscars, but like birds of prey is probably my favorite recent DC movie. Like, it's really I really good. It. Yeah. It's really good. Like, I like that she's weird. Yeah. Like, she's you a know? great actress. Like, yeah. Kind of all over the place. And I like it. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, it's very inclusive. It's like, it doesn't, you don't have to like be, it's, these are very mainstream films, but the sensibility going into them is really not. It's very counterculture. Yeah. So I just had one honorable mention. Um, although I would say that I saw Tatane, I thought it was great. Um, I think maybe this is our first year for No Movies in Hell. Actually, we've only been doing this since October. Um, but maybe for 2022, look back, we do most interesting and then favorite. Because I think those are two different categories for me. I agree. And I definitely feel like that that was my major conflict. Like most in, like Tatane was by far would have been in the top five most interesting, but not, it didn't make top five favorite. My honorable mention is card counter. Oh, I wasn't okay. expecting anything when I went in. I didn't know what it was about. I just had a free afternoon and I walked in and I loved it. Also, let's talk about Willem Dafoe for like two seconds. Oh my gosh. He's like, like actor of the year. He's he everything. Has been everything. <laughs> and he's been great yep and he sometimes i think he gets typecast a little bit as like this kind of 
yeah. guy that you love to hate, villain, you, who doesn't get a backstory, right? He's just like this kind of shadowy villain in the back. Well, he has his own energy. He doesn't look like anybody else. Like yeah. Willem Dafoe is only ever Willem Dafoe. <laughs> right, for sure. But ever since Lighthouse, I feel like I've been seeing him more and more and more and more and more and more and more. And he's even in, is he in the Northman that's coming out? I think he is. Probably. Um, the, Did you the, see the Florida Project? No. I tried to watch that three times and I can't get past the first half hour. I he's don't know why. He's great in it. I think it's a very it different performance for him. <laughs> um but yeah, I can. Sean Baker is also like very much his own. I just saw Red Rocket the other day, and it's like I saw Red Rocket yesterday, yeah. uh, the other day too. I thought that's it was a, great. That. That's another guy, like you know, nobody else is making this movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I do want to keep trying though with Florida Project. I maybe it's just I have to be in the right mindset going in. But Card Counter is my honorable mention. Wow, nice. But next year we should do two episodes: one top five most interesting two top five favorites favorites <laughs> and maybe three least favorite like top five least favorite no, of 2022 don't do that come <laughs> on i i have become both more and less forgiving of, of film and filmmakers <laughs> like uh watch something and she's like oh you were trying you know like the, oh, the worst thing in the world to me is when not i mean the worst thing in movies not the world uh <laughs> is when a movie just has nothing like they're just making a movie to make a movie you know yeah. it, it feels inevitable um i i try to never say i try to be very positive uh i do have no problem saying that being the ricardos was dog shit <laughs> i watched wow. that the other day and aaron sorkin's just not a director like wow. he's yeah like he it's so bad and like I wasn't a big fan of Molly's game. I thought Chicago Seven had its moments because he's very good in a courtroom. But man, being the Ricardos, it is the most like it is the most like everybody's clocking in and clocking out. <laughs> Just like it feels like everybody went to work and made a movie and nobody cared. Wow. I did see that movie. I was disappointed. I thought <laughs> I had such high hopes. For first of all, I love. Sure. Lucille Ball, like mm -hmm. for her to have her own show back then, unbelievable, right? Like she just had to be this amazing powerhouse to front her own show, to front her own studio, to be the creative, you know, that, like it was, I love Lucy, like not, I, not like, you know, like it's her show. She calls yeah. the shots. And for back in the day, like her and Carol Burnett, props to them. Mm -hmm. So all love for Lucille Ball. I wanted this to be such a good movie. And I was so sad that- Wouldn't it, it have been nice if he also liked Lucille Ball on the show? <laughs> Aww. It just, yeah. you know, and I'm sure it is very difficult to play such a beloved icon. Yeah. Because I, when I say I love Lucille Ball, I really love Lucy, like the character that she played. I don't really know anything about Lucille Ball. But I remember her from the sitcom. And so, which is a very short time period in her life. Um, and she was playing a character of her a version of herself, not really herself. So I'm sure it's very difficult to interpret the real person into something that people can relate to in the way that they want to relate to her. And so, yeah, so giving them that. I yeah. still thought it was disappointing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I do, I'm like, I feel bad. Like, I, I really don't ever want to talk shit about a filmmaker, but it's Aaron Sorkin. Like, it doesn't matter what some people on YouTube say. Like, he is, he's a great writer, you know? And yeah, like, it's, it's strange to me how, like, it feels very out of, um, he's so good but like oh, okay so like Clint Eastwood uh, that's another filmmaker where my mileage varies but like with Clint Eastwood the interesting thing is that you can always tell why he wanted to tell a story it may be the only good scene in that movie but you will <laughs> at some point be like okay this is this is what it was 
at no point in being the Ricardos did I feel like I got a sense of why it was important to Aaron Sorkin to make this movie. Hmm. You know, and maybe it is a great story. Instead of, yeah, maybe it was just to be first because I'm pretty sure that there are others and, you know, fans who are very interested in making it and haven't made it yet, you know? And yeah. he's just kind of like, oh, well, I can do something real quick. <laughs> yeah. Like, but isn't that the problem? <laughs> yes. Yes. You know, you're is. getting people up at 6 a.m. to like come and work on your thing. And it's like, you should at least have the respect for them to care. Yeah. There's a shot in it. There's a scene that plays out pretty much in one shot. And it's interesting. There's like, you can see what the goal was in so much of the Ricardos and so much of the movie. You can see like, oh, that's worked elsewhere. There's a shot that like, I am certain worked on paper, but in the course of the film, there was no thought. It's basically uh, Aliyah Shawkat and Nicole Kidman are talking in a hallway and there's a window between them. And oh. the window apparently is next to the sun. It is so bright and it washes out everything. And it's just like, why is this what you thought to do? Like, <laughs> like what is this telling us? Uh, like, what is the mise-en-scene here? What is this telling us about this conversation where they do feminism at each other? Like, it was, oh, there, and the whole movie was like that, where you're just like, why is this where the camera's at? Yeah. Like, what are you trying to do? Like, why? <laughs> I also I, don't think Nicole Kim was a very good Lucille Ball, <laughs> but. I will say, I well, I, so I was, I was, Totally, I like Nicole Kidman and I was totally willing to give her a chance to be Lucille. I think that she was cast because of her voice more than the way she looked Perfect. and moved like Lucille. Because when she does the radio, like if you close your eyes, she does sound like her. Mm. Um, the thing that I did like about the movie was J.K. Simmons. <laughs> As Fred Mertz, awesome. Like, I don't really even know anything about the actor who played Fred Mertz, but in that movie it was him he was that spot on yeah yeah <laughs> do you know who would have been a really good lucy deborah messing i've seen like uh, i've seen sort of yeah. like internet talk about like her and comparing pictures of her and lucille um and i think wasn't even kate blanchett supposed to be yeah. Lucille in this oh was she that would I have been fascinating so. um so i i you know but I do like Nicole Kidman and I was willing to give her a chance to be Lucy. Yeah. <laughs> but what? I think it's one of those things like you're, you're up against the wall. Like you're fighting a losing battle before you even get started because who's going to be Lucille? Like I saw Queen, like the band and they had, I can't remember, some, somebody else as the lead singer like doing, and he came out and he oh, said, yeah. look, I'm not going to be Freddie Mercury. Like no one can be Freddie Mercury, but I'm going to sing the song. and. Yeah. We're going to have like, fun tonight. That. Yeah. yeah. And that's fair. It's, <laughs> it's interesting, like, because getting to, the, you know, comparing pictures, I feel like we've t we spent more time talking about a movie we didn't like than <laughs> any of the movies we did. But um, I, I, I get kind of, it kind of annoys me that, like, how much it ma seems to matter to people that the person playing the real person looks like them. Yeah. Because we talk so much, or not we talk, but like in the movie, they talk so much about, uh, Lucy being kinetically gifted and being this great physical comedian but Nicole Kidman is not that and so you never get a sense of the thing that like they hung a show on mm -hmm. you know right. and it's just that like that's what I think about messing because like on Will and Grace she did a lot of that yeah you know it's just it, it's such a key part of who Lucille Ball was and it's just not there in the movie yeah, you know, and I mean, and you can make it's like with Spencer, which should probably should also be an honorable mention because I thought Spencer was fantastic. But like, there's been so many Princess Dime uh, shows and movies and everything yeah. that it's just like, yeah, you don't have to make the like ultimate one. You can just focus on things. And so, like, hopefully, this is not the only movie about Lucille Ball, and we get other glimpses of who she was. And there's obviously plenty of documentaries and stuff. But like, yeah, it just seemed like such a weird. Like, oh, Nicole Kidman is a great actress. We'll cast her and it'll be fantastic. It's just like, 
yeah, but like, <laughs> it's like casting. It's like if somebody's a baseball player and you put the most awkward performer in the role, like you never believe, if you don't believe them swinging a bat, it's going to be real hard for them to be a baseball player. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Anyway, right. That's enough about that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, st- I'll stop talking about how I don't want to shit talk things while I shit talk things. <laughs> all, well, I mean, I would have to say my worst of this year is probably don't look up. I, I not, I, I mean, it, I get it. It was just really meta that they had these actors who budgetary, you know, a hundred million plus for these actors to tell you about x y and z and that's the part that i just did not like if you would have gotten you know whatever middle of the road actors to do this then it would have meant something but for like leonardo dicaprio like jennifer lawrence like meryl streep at her worst i was just like this is awful and it's kind of throwing egg in the face of the audience again it's like we already know your habits here. And then it's like, oh, and by the way, we're paying these people X amount of money to tell you this. So here's another egg. It is just so right. It is like preaching to the choir, the movie. Like <laughs> you are not going to convert anyone and you're going to annoy people who agree with you. Cause yep. yeah, like we watched it at Christmas and it's just like, I should love this, but I really did not like it's one joke adam mckay made Step Brothers, a movie that is like so dense with jokes that like you can just keep unpacking it has one yep there's one joke that it just keeps hammering over and over again for two hours yep like, oh man almost two and a half hours it was pretty long it's john lee john lee put it best just because you're accurate doesn't mean you're interesting <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah and yeah. it's like the worst thing that you need to hear right now, like this would have been great a couple years ago with, yes, with the different actors and all that other stuff. Like, it's like now, now you want to do this? Like, no. (laughs) Yeah. And you can, like, you can do that. You can just hold up a mirror and like, that that can be, that can yield great art, but you got to have something to say about it. You can't just be like, huh? Isn't it just like Twitter? Huh? Yeah. Eh? <laughs> oh god i'm so annoyed yeah <laughs> yeah and i actually think like leo was good i think a lot of them were like good in it it's just i don't care he, he uh he annoys me like i've yeah i was a a fan of his, like not even a fan like i liked his film i liked his acting maybe 20 years ago now mm. it's just kind of like i need to pick these parts he got his Oscar, right? He got his Oscar six years ago or something like that. Yeah. Like wow. do something that's interesting. Like be a villain for once. Be like, be interesting. Be a Tom Hardy. Like don't, I don't know who chooses these projects for him, but they're like, not that great. They're like, it's I, so lackluster. I thought he was amazing in Wolf of Wall Street. I love that. I wish he'd gotten his Oscar for that. That would have felt more appropriate to me. Like just the just the Quaalude sequence alone. But like he's <laughs> so good in that movie. And but it's that's a thing acting. that like yeah, like he hadn't done that. You know, you kind of watch it like I did not know Leonardo DiCaprio was funny. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of like you know, like Bradley Cooper when they made uh, Star is Born. Everybody's like, and you can sing. Yeah. Get out. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's you're that's is annoying me now. You're too good at stuff. Go. Like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I yeah, I also did not like that movie. <laughs> See, Adam, and I, I like think the big short. Really... Oh, sorry. Oh, I was gonna say, I think you really want to do next year's least favorite <laughs> movie episode. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> or like a, a Q1 recap. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Because we all know January film. <laughs> I don't I know. know. There's a lot to look forward to next year, I think. Um, Is there? I think so. I'm not being like facetious. <laughs> I don't know a lot of what's coming out. Like I know Mission Impossible 7 or like the next Mission Impossible movie comes out next year. And I'm very excited for that. But like, oh, wow. I, I know don't that. know much about what's coming out next year. I did see that on a list. I was just looking right before this call started and there is a Bob's Burger movie planned for next year. 
Oh, wow. Oh, that makes me happy. I know. Like, if you need a hug, like that is going to be a hug. Like, Mm -hmm. I love that show. I like, I have it on in the background all the time because now there are enough episodes that you can just let it go for the whole day. Yeah. Um, And I just, I love it. Um, So I'm looking forward to that. I didn't even know anything about it. I just saw it on a list, Bob Burgers, the movie. And I was like, yes, whatever, whenever that comes out, I'm down. Um, The Northman. Oh, yes. All right. That's on my list. Definitely. I think April's going to be very good for film. Yes. That Michelle Yeoh movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, Oh, yeah. Everything, every. Everything, Everything, everywhere, all the time. Yes. Yes. That is opening night at South by Southwest. I'm, I'm, I should be there for it. So I'm hoping, I'm excited to see that. Nice. Uh, Do you, so, did you guys see Swiss Army Man? Oh, the, yes. The previous yeah. one by those directors? <laughs> That's another one. Great. I tried to watch it twice and I couldn't get, I, could, I couldn't get engaged. That's one of those, like, goes on the most interesting list. Like that thing okay. is yeah. with ideas. And then one of the directors, I was, this is funny. I, I was just talking about this movie yesterday too. It's another one that I try to champion whenever I can, but one of the directors did a movie called the death of Dick long. Have either of you heard of it? No. Okay. It is another beautiful movie. I, okay. I'm really, I'm like a big fan of this should not work like an idea that should not work. Cause then you have to work really hard to make it work. The, what that movie is about should not work. <laughs> but like the heart at, of it is so pure, you know, cause it's, a, it's about connection and loneliness. You know, maybe you're getting the idea that that is a thing I appreciate a lot, uh, but it, it is, it's about a guy who has sex with a horse. <laughs> There's no dressing it up. He, you don't see him do it, but like, it's about a guy <clears throat> who has sex with his horse and it's a beautiful movie. <laughs> Right. Death of Dick Long. <laughs> so yeah, those I, filmmakers I will follow. I'll follow anywhere. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I'm, I trust you at this point. <laughs> I wrote Any it down. Was. Well, yeah. uh, check it out. <laughs> Very curious to hear your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll do an episode about it, and then we'll have you back. <laughs> oh boy, that, I like I said, it's on Showtime. If I if you guys have that. I think oh it's- yeah, that's one service I don't have. Yeah. Um that's the worst thing about this right like everything there's just so many channels yes splintered the distribution of it should be like a grid of like where you can find things and make it easy for you to to find right um yeah i do at least like that they're no longer cracking down on people sharing passwords like because it's just like well if everyone's gonna have to get gonna have their own streamer then we're gonna have to share you're gonna have to be okay with it yeah (laughs) up to a certain amount um yeah um gosh they yeah i'm i'm definitely looking forward to films start i I guess like starting february on (laughs) um i think 355 is coming out in january and that looks fun then why did they put it in january (laughs) january is like the worst (laughs) like that's where the dumping ground but we need something in january in january what's it get out no i think it was february I, maybe it was february yeah because it, it came out like the weekend of the oscars yeah yeah then it was like february yeah then it was february but we need oh yeah jordan Peele's new movie comes out oh, right in nope. august um nope n-o-p-e yes i'm i'm guessing that it's that the acronym stands for not on planet earth, but who knows? Maybe he's taking it. not even thought about that. Extraterrestrial (laughs) this time, who knows? But very excited. I love all of his stuff. I love Keanu. And I was like, at the end of Matrix, (laughs) the latest Matrix, I was like, what happens if Keanu joins the (laughs) Matrix? Right, joins the Catrix. You know Um, what? Uh, I've seen the trailer a few times. I'm really, I, I don't know. I don't know that I'd say I'm excited, to see, but like, I know I'm going to be there like probably opening weekend. Dog, the Channing Tatum movie with the dog. Oh my gosh, yes. That looks delightful. It looks really good. <laughs> um, very happy for him. Um, 
I was not not expecting to see this trailer at all and saw it in front of Spider-Man. And I was like, you know what? This actually looks really good. Good for Channing Tatum. He's been, I mean, I don't know what he's been working on. Probably this, but it's good. Looks Wait, good. Cyrano. When does that oh, come out? Oh, that's a good question. I thought that already had come out. I think it is. I, I think it's supposed to come out this month. This month? That's December? tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> By tomorrow. Okay. I mean, huh. Maybe it did like a week long, like Academy qualifying run, and then they're yeah. going to put it out in January when, yeah. Maybe it was cannibalized by Spider Man. Always possible. I will say, I did love the new Spider Man. Like, I, I, I didn't want to talk about it because it doesn't need my help. You know, like, <laughs> you know, it made, it literally made all the money, mm-hmm. it made 92% of the box office that weekend, which yeah. is, you know, scary. But, that's a that's a movie with a massive heart. Yes. And I saw it with my friend Scott, who does a podcast about comic books and comic movies. And at one point, I leaned over like, I did not see this movie. Like whatever it was, it was from one of the Andrew Garfield. There was like a you know, it's when the, the electricity, like all that stuff. I was like, oh, I, electro. Yeah, but I got it. Like yeah. I got everything that was happening, but I was just like, I did not see this. I don't know who this person is. <laughs> but cool. Yeah, I really, I really dug Spider Man. I love it. All right. So thank you, Adam, for joining. Thank you. Um, thank you. Anything thank you for having to plug? me. Do you, hmm? Yeah. Do you have anything to plug? We do have the section at the end where we talk about things that are coming up for us personally, projects that we have, anything to plug. Sometimes there's nothing. That's okay too. Um, um, but yeah, there, I mean, there's obviously social media at Adam Stovall on Twitter, at not Adam S on Instagram, uh, at a ghost waits on Twitter. Uh, and then a ghostweights.com and arrow actually does have, they have their own streaming streaming platform, arrow dash player.com. They have a lot of really great stuff, not just like modern, you know, contemporary kind of cult cinema or, you know, niche cinema, but also like some classic stuff, uh, cinema paradiso and Texas Chainsaw Massacre and all kinds of stuff. So, uh, you know, they're, they're really worth checking out. Um, and Nothing upcoming yet. I'm finishing a script for what we think will be the next movie. I've been working on it for a very long time because <laughs> this year became crazy. Um, but yeah, hoping hoping to have it done, you know, within the next month. And then we've we've got a few companies waiting to see it. So hopefully it'll move quickly. It's a time travel road movie. Uh, awesome. so, very cool. Yeah. So well, we'll, we'll wait to see more about that. Yes. All yeah. the best to you, and hope to have you come back. I would love to. Thank you very much. This was this is a lot of fun. I always love talking about movies. So, yeah. so do we. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, Claude, do you have anything to plug? Uh, nothing much other than our own Ethereum wallet. So we have our own Ethereum wallet. Um, it's nmih.eth. Uh, so feel free if you can like us here on YouTube, subscribe, and then you can donate to nmih. Nice. Chris, do you have anything to plug? I have nothing to plug, um, but I am excited about um, the coming year and all the things that uh, will hopefully come out. Um, So looking forward to it. Really hoping things, really hoping it starts picking up next year, you know, like 2020 and 2021 ran together so much. It's like, can we just please, please have some new stuff? Let's have some precedented times, guys. <laughs> I like to go out, you know, I just like to be able to go outside and it not, it's what I miss. Like, like New York is like, it's such a great spontaneous, spontaneous place. You go, you walk out your front door, you can get to an adventure. Like I'm so over just having to think about everything all the time. <laughs> like, oh, is this, you know, getting tested before I see my friends? I'm just like, I just would like this to be done. Yes. If we could do this taping in person, that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. (laughs) That would be lovely. To go see a movie and not be freaked out by people sitting too close to you. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to get the empty theaters in uh, Times Square. Right, right. (laughs) 